بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته حديث نمبر 196 حديث of عبد الله بن عمرو بن العاص in a different narration he says may Allah be pleased with him that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the best fasting at the side of Allah is that of David or Dawood peace be upon him and the best prayer is that of Dawood peace be upon him for he slept half of the night and stood for prayer for the third of the night and then slept the sixth part of it and he observed fast one day and broke on the other day. We spoke about the first portion which is fasting one day and skipping one day but here the Prophet ﷺ is telling us how to offer night prayer and the best means of offering night prayer is to sleep half of the night and pray one third of the night and then sleep one sixth of the night again so it's a sleeping then praying then also sleeping so that when you wake up for Fajr you have enough energy to do so and if the night is 12 hours one third of it would be four hours so this means that he would sleep for six hours and pray for four hours and sleep again for two hours however if you calculate it from Maghrib till Fajr then you have two hours off of that so then your calculation would be from the Isha time until the Fajr time and usually if Isha is approximately eight average and Fajr is six at average these are ten hours Sleeping half of it is five hours, and this is more than sufficient. Most of us sleep five hours a day, especially those who go to work early and spend about 10 to 12 hours either commuting or working. So by the time you get back home and you have dinner and you sit and do things with the family and so on, usually you only get five hours to sleep. So in this hadith, no, it's more than that. You sleep for five hours and you pray for approximately two hours and a half to three hours and then you sleep the final hour. This was the best of prayer as described by the Prophet wasalam, And this is the prayer of Prophet Dawood. Why did the Prophet devise Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As with it? because Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As used to pray the whole night no sleep at all so the Prophet instructed him to do this and in another narration the Prophet told him that your body has rights over you your wife and family have rights over you your eye has rights over you meaning you have to sleep your guest has rights over you and your Lord Allah has rights over you so give each one its due right the same narration the same hadith the same advice was given by Salman al Farisi to his brother Abu Darda when he visited him once and he found that he was exactly like Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As fasting all day praying all night so he insisted that he breaks his fast and he insisted that he does not pray until that last third of the night and then he told him this phrase when Abu Darda went to the Prophet and told him what Salman said the Prophet said والسلام, Salman has told you the truth so what do we learn from this we learn the importance of balance in our lives Muslims have to be balanced and this balance is what a lot of us fail to achieve some of us have a target which is good by itself but if the target makes you neglect other priorities then you are in loss 
Some of us have a target of being the top of his company, being the CEO, being a rich businessman, being an influential entrepreneur, for example. So he works hard for this, maybe 14 hours a day, 15 hours a day, meetings, traveling, very hard working hours. Yet he neglects his prayer because he has a meeting. He neglects fasting because he has to work long hours and he cannot do this while he's fasting Ramadan. He neglects his wife's rights because he's all the time working and when he's home, he's on his email or surfing the net and he doesn't have time for her. Even on the weekends, he goes with his friends because he misses them. He neglects the rights of his children. He does not teach them. He does not bring them up in Islamic manners because he himself is not brought up in an Islamic manner. He does not have any boundaries regarding halal or haram. Everything is halal. He neglects his health because he's working so long and so hard. He develops after a few years high blood pressure, high levels of cholesterol. He might turn to be diabetic. He has this, he has that, deficiencies in so many things. And all of this because of his target. And this does not please Allah Azza wa Jal. And it also does not please Allah that you seclude yourself and isolate yourself in the masjid, only worshipping Allah, praying, fasting, and not doing anything else. This is not part of Islam. Because you need someone to support you. So those who give you sadaqah, those who give you money, so that you can live and your family can live, they are far, far greater than you at the side of Allah. So the issue of balance is completely important and very rarely that you would find Muslims having this balance, being able to take care of their family, being able to take care of their religion and learning process, being able to give da'wah, being able to have their own time with Allah Azza wa Jal for cleansing their heart. I've seen a lot of the brothers who are engaged in da'wah get burnt out after a while. What does that mean? They are so active in da'wah, in making lectures and organizing lectures and organizing events and so on, distributing leaflets, doing this, doing that, all for the cause of Allah. That's very good. But so many times I meet these brothers and ask them, when was it the last time you skipped Fajr prayer in the masjid? He says, Sheikh, I pray only two or three days a month in the masjid. The rest, I am so dead, I cannot pray. He said, why? He said, I spend my time at night until 1 or 2 a.m. working on preparation for events, for da'wah, for so on. I cannot wake up for Fajr. So the issue of balance, you have to have some time at night to worship Allah. No one knows about night prayer except Allah. You have to fast certain days of the month, at least three days. This is between you and Allah. You don't go to people in the office and oh, I'm very tired today. And the guy does not ask you why. He doesn't ask you. And he's just doing his paperwork. And then you say, do you know why I'm tired? Yesterday I prayed for an hour and man, I feel asleep. Subhanallah, you're exposing your good deeds. And then you say, and alhamdulillah, today I'm fasting. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. He didn't ask you, but you come out of your way to show him this means that you're not doing it for Allah. No, you have to have something between you and Allah. Something secret. Something that when you are in need, you raise your hand and say, Oh Allah, because I have done so and so for your sake, Oh Allah, forgive my sins. Oh Allah, make this happen. Because I found a limping cat on the road was about to die and I took it before the cars ran over it and I took it on the sidewalk because I made a blind man cross the street and I helped him for your sake I don't go around telling people oh Allah do this and that for me you have to have something between you and Allah but when you don't then you're in trouble and when you don't have this balance you are in double trouble and our religion is built and based on justice and fairness so you have to be fair to yourself to your family to your work to your religion and to your body you have to be 
holistic, not only focusing on one part and neglecting the rest. Hadith number 198, narrated by Abu Hurairah, may Allah be pleased with him. He said, my dear friend, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Khalili, which is the highest level of friendship. He said that he ordered me to do three things, to fast the th three days every month, to pray two rak'ahs of the duha, and to do witr before going to sleep. Now you all know that the Prophet ﷺ advised his companions and gave each one of them what he needs. So if someone of them was maybe a little bit angry, a little bit stressed, when he asked the Prophet ﷺ for advice, the Prophet told him, do not become angry. And he said, give me more, do not become angry, do not become angry, and he kept on repeating it. And when another one told him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I want to be with you in Jannah, he said, help me by offering as many prayers as you can. Why? Because maybe the Prophet saw that this man was calm. He didn't need to be told, don't be angry. But he is not offering voluntary prayers. So the Prophet encouraged him to do so. A third person said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I would like to be with you in paradise. The Prophet told him, والسلام, keep your tongue moistured, keep it wet by dhikr Allah, meaning all the time keep giving dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, and this draws you closer to Allah. Abdullah ibn Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him and with his father, when he saw in his dream that he was brought into hell, and he saw the people being tortured into hell, when he was afraid, Two men came to him and said to him, don't be worried, you are not from the people of hell. So he woke up frightened and he told Hafsa about it, his sister, who told in, by her turn to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet said, Abdullah ibn Umar is the best of companions. If he would pray night prayer, meaning that everything is complete except he doesn't offer night prayer. Abdullah says, and since that day, I never left night prayer. So the Prophet gives the proper advice depending on the people. We have a short break. Stay tuned. Inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Now, Abu Huraira, may Allah be pleased with him, is telling us about a special advice, a special order from the Prophet ﷺ. This advice was given to him because the Prophet knew him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the advice? First advice was, do not sleep before offering witr. This is strange. We know that the Prophet recommended that we make our last night prayer to be witr. And the best of witr is the last of the night. Yet the Prophet is instructing him not to sleep before witr. Why? Scholars say that Abu Huraira's companionship to the Prophet ﷺ was how many years do you think? Five, ten, twenty? It was less than four years. Abu Huraira spent all of his years with the Prophet ﷺ accompanying him and memorizing and learning from him. So Abu Huraira was known, may Allah be pleased with him, to memorize the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. And every time some of the companions doubted what he said, he always brought someone to testify when they did not know. And they all acknowledged that Abu Huraira knew things that they did not know of because of these last three years and a half where he was with the Prophet ﷺ. So scholars say, Abu Huraira used to spend most of his night memorizing the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. That is why he did not have enough time to pray night prayer. And hence, when he went to bed, the Prophet instructed him to do what? To offer witr before going to bed. After the death of the Prophet ﷺ, as 
we read in Sira Alam al Nubala for Al Imam al Zahabi, which is a very useful and beautiful book, it's quite big. He stated that Abu Huraira, his brother, and their mother, in one narration, and their servant, but most likely it's his mother. After the death of the Prophet, والسلام, the learning process was over. Now he's not memorizing because the Prophet died. So they used to divide the night into three shifts. So Abu Huraira would pray the first third and then goes to sleep. His mother would pray the second third and then she would go to sleep and then his brother would pray the third shift. When his mother died, he divided the night between him and his brother. So half of the night he would pray and half of the night his brother would pray. But this was in the beginning. And from this we learn that it is permissible for a person to offer witr before he goes to bed. If he's afraid that he will not be able to what? To wake up before Fajr. But if you can wake up before Fajr and you know that you will wake up before Fajr, do not offer witr except at the end of the night. So what happens if I offer witr before I go to bed? And mashallah, I managed to wake up an hour before Fajr. Scholars say that you pray two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, two rak'ahs, these are tahajjud. But you do not repeat the witr again because the Prophet said, والسلام, there are no two witr in one night. Okay, what is the ruling then on if I pray one witr so that this witr with the witr before I slept becomes shafa' and then I pray one third witr. This is of course not permitted because then you would have disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ twice. When you prayed the second witr, which he told you do not do, and then you prayed the third witr, which is originally not acceptable. Abu Huraira said, and he instructed me ﷺ to pray two rak'ahs of duha. And we know duha prayer, we spoke about that before. And then he said, he commanded me to fast three days of every month. The same instruction he gave to Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As when he told him fast three days and this is considered to be fasting the whole year. So are these days any given days? Scholars say there are two levels. The first level is you fast the white days, 13th, 14th, and 15th. This is the best. Of course, you cannot fast the 13th in the Hajjah because this is forbidden for you to fast. But any other month, you fast 13th, 14th, and the 15th, this is the best. Second level, if I'm unable to fast these days, fast any three given days of a month. And most preferred and most advised would be Mondays and Thursdays because the Prophet encouraged alayhi salatu wasalam, us to do this and he told us that the deeds of the humans are displayed to Allah Azza wa on Mondays and Thursdays and that is why I love to be in the state of fasting when my deeds are displayed to Allah Azza wa Jal. I think we have a few minutes left so if there are any questions Assalamu alaikum Sheikh, as you mentioned about a balance in our lives, if it's not there, it could cause uh, destruction. So I wanted to know that today we see that there are many people uh, who accuse the practicing brothers and sisters of extremism. In such case, like, why are you having a beard? Why are you offering five times salah? Listen to music, watch TV, don't wear hijab. So even in such cases, they are accused of extremism. So as uh, the things mentioned in the hadith, what are exactly acts of extremism apart from the things mentioned in hadith and how do we reply to these so-called I mean uh, modern people who accuse practicing Muslim brothers and sisters of extremism that's a very good question but it needs a lecture rather than a quick answer but in a nutshell those who accuse you of being extreme ask them one question and one question alone what I am doing and what you're criticizing was it done by the Prophet ﷺ or not? If they say it was not, then they're right. It is extreme. 
But if they say, yes, it was, but, this but, tell them, I will not accept. As long as it was done by the Prophet, والسلام, either you're accusing him as well of extremism, and if you do, you become a kafir, you have nullified your Islam, or you have a misconception that has to be clarified. How do I know what is considered to be extreme? It's very simple. Display it, cross-examine it to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. So if someone says, on the time of the Prophet ﷺ, beard was accepted, but now it's not, because the Americans, the British, the Europeans, the this, the that, they don't have beards. I would argue with them and say, who instructed us to grow the beard? Who said, grow the beard, let go of the beard? Five verbs of instructing in Arabic, just to honor it, to leave it. Who told us to do this? If they say nobody, then these are not true or proper Muslims, because the hadith is in Bukhari. No one can argue with it. It is the Prophet who commanded us. Now, if you say that time changes, then you are accusing the Qur'an of lying. Because Allah says, الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ I have completed your religion. So the religion has been completed. If you come today and say, yes, but now we have to take this out, and we have to take this out, and this is considered to be barbaric, and this is considered to be uncivilized, you're changing the deal of Allah. So always, don't be flared up. Don't be angry when people talk to you about this. Take it easy, tell them sit down, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, and let's talk about it. And at the end of the session, it will be an eye-opener. Because these people have been misguided by the media, by their peers, by the liberals who claim that this is not Islamic. General things they say without thinking about it. And when you tell them, where is the reference? What's your evidence? They don't know even how to wash themselves after they answer the call of nature. So take it easy, give them da'wah, teach them, tell them, show them what is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and what is the right way of doing it. And this is the way you can differentiate between following the sunnah and extremism. Extremism is not part of the sunnah, it's not part of our religion. However, weakness and humility and abandoning the way of the Prophet is also not part of our religion. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fiyamanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.